So I'm back here in Composite FX in Trenton, Florida, and now they're making their own rotor blades. We're gonna walk you through step by step exactly how they're made. My name is Dwight Junkin. I am one of the founding members of Mosquito Helicopters and the CEO of Composite FX, where we manufacture the helicopter here in Trenton, Florida. All right, if you could walk us through one of the many different processes you guys have for making your own rotor blades. Okay, um, well, we'll start with the skins, which is an 031 um, aircraft grade uh, aluminum that we use. And if you look up on the shelf, you'll see the skins. They are CNC sheared and CNC broke to a 90 degree uh, angle. Uh, they're sized, pre-sized before all that's done. Once that process is done, then we go through a uh, sanding abrasive uh, process as well as a chemical treatment process before uh, actually bonding them together. But prior to the chemical uh, treatment, we also have to do we form them in a roll former that we actually made. So the roll form actually takes the skin from a 90 and puts the curvature in it. It's a, uh, it is not a symmetrical blade, it's semi-symmetrical, so the bottom and the top is two different shapes. So something else really interesting here at Composite FX, if they need a custom machine, they just build it themselves. The one behind me here is used to form the skin for the rotor. It, it goes through a series of rollers here and goes from a 90 degree angle to a more or less like a 30 degree angle bend as it goes through the machine. So what this roll former does is actually puts that shape into the skins. So the skins load in from this side, this little V here is what keeps it in line with these rollers as it's fed through the rollers. Then it comes forward to each one of these dies. There's five dies here and each one of them strike the uh, bending moment just a little deeper each time until it gets to the end when it comes off and has the full depth uh, rolled onto what the skin is gonna need once it goes into the mold. Uh, once that process is done, you'll also notice that both these sides, you have a B on one side, and if you were to look on the other side, there's an A. So that's the difference in that curvature. The A side, we consider the top of the blade, which has more of an aerodynamic shape to it than the bottom does. And once that's gone through this process, then we go to another roller process, which is down here. I was super impressed with this machine, as it looked like something you would order straight out of a catalog, not a one-off custom design. There is something so gratifying watching a machine do the work it was designed to do. And what this, this roller does is it has two striking points on it. And it only strikes the A side. And what it does is it puts the, what's referred to as the reflex on the blade. If you were to look at the blade, you'll see the trailing edge is kind of a slightly bent on one side and it's flat area. That is a very, very critical how much reflex you have on it because it's a direct result in where the center of the pressure of the blade is when it's flying. So in our particular case, in a helicopter, it's a direct result of how much collective pressure there is when you go to pull up. Obviously, if the center of pressure is too far back on the blade, then the pressure to lift it gets extremely heavy. If it's too far forward, it can be actually negative pressure, and that's not good either. So that's why it's so important to strike a, a perfect balance on that reflex. Roll formers, we've roll formed the shape this way, and we've also rolled the reflex on it. You can see as the skin is in this here particular uh, jig, you can see how that would work. Now the, the reflex is on the A side, the top of the blade, no reflex on the bottom. So now we move to the spar. Now the spar is also air graph, high aircraft grade aluminum. It's machine fit inside and out. Now on the spar, there is what we call a doubler, which is also aircraft grade aluminum. And then there's a tip weight, which is actually brass. 
Uh, the tip weight is about, it's a little over a pound and a half that's used at the external tips of blade for giving the blade more inertia. And then the doubler is actually mounted where the grip bolts actually go through the blade to mount it to the helicopter. Now that's in there because we don't want to crush the blade or anything like that. It leaves a solid mass of material for everything to compress on. So what we have here is a spar and the doubler goes on the inside as well as the tip weight. I don't know if you can see that or not, but the brass tip weight is on this end. Now the way these are, they're bonded in and they're bolted in both. Uh, so once those are done, then the spar is loaded into the skin like so. Now that is also bonded all the way around the entire circumference of the spar and then the trailing edge is also bonded together back here. All right, so you do, in fact, have a bit of CNC capabilities here. What do you do in your CNC machine? Well, this particular CNC machine was bought specifically for manufacturing the blades. Uh, this machine does the spars and actually trims the size of the blade and drills the mounting holes in it. But what you're looking at here is the spars inside the machine. And to give you an idea of how the process works is all of this around here, this is all fixture and jig. This is a spar sitting on top of a post. This is a spar upside down in and clamped down this way. So the machine, even though the table, this is a 10 foot long table, 120 inches. And so you get some variances in the table over, over the distance of, of that table. So what we did was is we mounted this thick aluminum plate permanently into the table and then we fly cut the whole table. So now we know we've got a perfectly flat table. So that's where we started with. Then these here pieces that you see here are fixtures, those are CNC'd in our smaller CNC machine and they're permanently mounted to that table then. And so now, you, usually the process starts with, we start with the back one. You put the spar in, which is extruded. It's an extruded spar, but it's 20 thousandths too large all the way around when we extrude it because we want to machine it to size. The reason we want to do that is because our glue joint has to end up to be three to five thousandths thick once this whole process is done. So by machining it, we can hold those tolerances in order to get that. So this is a spar the way it would come from us. It's put in there, mounted down, and then we have custom machined tooling that actually cuts these profiles and shapes on there. The first one that we cut is this internal one. That is a specific size and shape, so we cut that shape. Once that's done, this spar would come out, flip over, come down onto this post, and it's clamped down here in the back. Then there's a different bit with the profile. This would be the A side of the spar. So you can see there's a, there's a difference in the back and the front on the profile. So it's an asymmetrical profile. So this is the A side, so that would machine that side. Now once that side's done, then there's some clamps that will actually come in here and hold the A side to the same jig, we'll remove these back ones, and then a different profile bit will come in and do the back side of that bit. We are partnering with great companies like Dynon Avionics at Dynon.com, Clemens Insurance at ClemensInsurance.net. The Aviators Clinic at aviatorsclinic.com. Foxtrot 95, Calhoun County Airport at flyfoxtrot95.com. Take a moment to go visit their websites at the links found below in the description of this video. And visit our website at experimentalaircraftchannel.com for events, our video library arranged in easy to find playlists on specific topics, affiliate products, aviation merchandise, and so much more. So what specifically is done in this fixture here in preparation for the bonding? Okay, so now what we're gonna do is chemically treat these 
items, anywhere there's a bonding surface, they're going to get chemically treated. Aluminum does not want to adhere. Paints and things like that do not want to adhere to them. Alu aluminum is corroding from the instant you sand it, it's, it's corroding. So you have to actually seal the aluminum. And then after that, there's an etching process that has to be done in order to give the bonding agent something to bite into. So that's the process we're about ready to begin. Then we'll apply the bonding uh, agent. Then it'll go into the oven and get baked. They utilize a common heat gun to raise the surface temperature of the metal just before they apply the epoxy tape. It is rolled on to ensure good contact and to eliminate any possible air pockets. The assembly is nearly ready to be installed into the fixture, then into the oven. The fixture is thoroughly cleaned immediately before inserting the rotor blade assembly. All right, so now this very big contraption here that I think you call an oven, <laughs> you yeah. want to explain how that is uh, in the process of building rotors? Yeah, this is actually the curing oven for the blades once uh, all the process has been treated and the bonding agent has been applied. The blade actually goes in here, the oven is in two halves as you can see, here's the top, this is the bottom. It's a match die set, machined out of a solid billet uh, aluminum that we've turned into an oven. So if you look at the top of the oven here, you'll see uh, three heating, industrial heating pads. On the bottom there's also three industrial heating pads, they're made specifically for this oven. So the blade basically gets loaded in, uh, we close the mold up, and then we insert um, if you look over here, this is an end cap for the oven itself and you'll see these here silicone tubes that actually go into the interior of the blade at the time which is another end cap on the other side. Those One, go inside? Inside the blade itself, right. So what's going on here is when everything is closed up, this actually gets inflated and what it does is it puts pressure on the spar on the blade, pushes it forward and it also takes the skin and makes it tight against the exterior uh, walls of the mold itself. They actually expand that much. Yeah, they expand that much. And you'll see there's three different sizes because the leading edge obviously is, sure. the gap is wider and then it gets smaller. But these inflate till it fills that entire cavity, puts pressure on everything. Then we actually fire the oven up and start the cure process of the, of the bonding agents. And we can go over here, this actually is a custom made uh, computer controlled oven for this. Uh, a good friend of ours, Philip Blaha, he's the one that designed this specifically for this. So what we have is a touch screen control panel over here on this, uh, this wall here. And this is the control mechanism. It's all touch screen. It actually controls the heat up process, the ramp up speed process as well as the dwell time of the temperature it takes to cure the, uh, the adhesive. That's so, amazing you actually have logic in this. I thought it was just a little cooking timer. Yeah, no, it's, it's much more complicated than that. There's actually six heating zones like we talked about earlier. There's three pads on the top, three pads on the bottom. Each one of them has their own thermal couple in them. Then we also have temperature sensors in the mold in all six zones. So that's why you see so many zones here. There's actually six zones. So the computer is actually constantly monitoring the temperature of the mold in that zone as well as the temperature of the heating pad in that zone. And the computer constantly modulates those to keep the temperature the same 
all the way during a ramp up. Now the ramp up temperature is important. You just can't turn it on and light the fire and let it go to it. There is a limit on how much temperature you can throw at it per minute. So it's somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five degrees per minute. And this is to stay under that. This is more of the sensitivity of the epoxy. Right. Okay. Right. Now, once it is achieved to the maximum temperature, then there is a dwell time. It has to be between 30 and 90 minutes. That has to hold that temperature in order to cure it properly. But it has to hold it within a few degrees. So that's the reason why the computer is there. It's not as simple as just lighting the fire and putting an egg timer on it. We know when we're done with this process, the computer logs all of this data. So when we finish a blade, we actually have a data log of each one of those heat strips and each section of that mold. We know how fast it ramped up. We know how long the dwell time was on the curing process. Then once that's done, we also cut a sample. All of our blades are made longer than they need to be, so we always cut a sample, two coupons out of, that, out of the blade, and we actually have rigged up a testing uh, system on a uh, hydraulic press where we can actually pull test those glue joints, and so every single blade goes through that testing process. So one is a sacrificial lamb, the other is for uh, filing away. Right. As you can see, there are many steps involved to get to this point right here. And once the epoxy tape is applied, the countdown begins. I'm sure many of us have seen a mold for fiberglass composites, but this is the first time I've ever seen an aluminum composite mold that uses internal pressure to help keep the shape during the curing process. Now to thread the silicone spaghetti through the eye of the needle, so to speak. Now they lower in place the upper cover for the oven and set the timer to bake. All right, now this thing is in the oven, it's baking. I am uh, Wade with Composite Effects, and uh, we just stuck the blade in the oven and uh, ready to turn on the cure mode. So this is just an interface that a friend of the company built for us that uh, controls the ramp up and, the, and holding it at the correct temperature. It's got a bunch of sensors. These are each the heater temperature and the mold itself. So we have readouts from the heaters and probes actually in the mold that tell us what temperature it is and there are six zones three on top and uh, three on the bottom and this just makes sure that we can monitor it and make sure all the heaters are working Hot off the press, or at least it was today, it doesn't need to be removed immediately as it has its own cool down process. It can be removed cold as well. At this point, the rotor blade is inserted into a fixture and the edges final machine to a set dimension. A few mounting holes are drilled and this is what you then mount on your helicopter.
The rotor blade is left long intentionally to cut off one end and following record of manufacturing. These are the pieces cut in half, one for the test and one for the filing cabinet. separation test. The epoxy residue is equally on both sides. And that is how Composite FX makes their rotor blades. Thanks for watching this week's episode of the Experimental Aircraft Channel. Remember to like, subscribe, and hit that bell so you don't miss a single episode.